name is a funny thing. We use it, we plan it, we waste it. Some people have even killed it. It even can change on us. For example, two weeks on vacation is not the same amount of time as two weeks on a diet. <laughs> it, yeah. Yet interestingly enough, we all have the same amount, no matter who we are. It's equal. And that included Jesus while he was here on this earth. He put himself into time. He who was eternal. Every event of his life and his death, I might add, was part of a plan. What plan? The plan for mankind's redemption. Towards the end of his ministry, he told his disciples, For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. In other words, Jesus could not die until Jesus said so. No matter what was happening on this earth in the events of his life, he wasn't going to die until he allowed it. Let me give you some examples. I, uh, it, when I started looking through this, I was amazed how many times they tried to kill him off. And it didn't work. Some examples. Luke 4, 28 to 30. Jesus had just finished making one of his first claims to being the Messiah. For those who wanted to listen, it was quite clear that, if I may use the expression, he was throwing his hat in the ring. He did tell people he was the Messiah. Here's their response. And all in the synagogue were filled with rage as they heard these things. And they rose up and cast him out of the city and led him to the brow of the hill on which their city had been built in order to throw him down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went his way. How he did it, I don't know. Whether he pulled an invisible man thing or a stop action thing, I don't know. But being God the Son, a group of angry people, a mob, who wanted to toss him to his death, couldn't do a thing. Couldn't do a thing. John 7, 30. They were seeking, therefore, to seize him. And no man laid his hand on him because, and here's the key, his hour had not yet come. Once again, this seeking to seize him was to kill him. And they couldn't. His hour had not yet come. In John 8, third 20, it says, No one seized him because his hour had yet not yet come. In both of these incidences, Jesus had basically said, I'm on the same level as God. In the one case, he actually said, the Father and I are one. And to the Jews, this was blasphemy. This deserved death. 
And both times, though they tried, they could not kill him. Why? His hour had not yet come. In John 10, 31 to 39, the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Therefore, they were seeking again to seize him, and he eluded their grasp. Why? His hour had not yet come. Now, when it says the Jews, you have to remember, this was not talking about the common Jewish nation, the people. This was talking about the religious leaders, Pharisees, Sadducees, Sanhedrin, scribes, priests, all the ones who were trying to find favor with God through their works. Jesus even said, unless your righteousness exceeds the Pharisees and scribes, you'll never get into heaven. <laughs> they knew that he was actually telling them, you're not good enough. All the works that you do to find favor with God are garbage. In Isaiah it says filthy rags. So these are the Jews, the spiritual leaders of the nations. They're the ones who wanted to get rid of Jesus, and they could not. No matter how hard they tried. But then something happened. We call it the Last Supper. Jesus was with his disciples. And in the book of John, it's a fascinating read. If you've never read, like from chapter 12 to his crucifixion, you read, which is like chapter 19 or so, you should read his prayer. It's phenomenal. Phenomenal. That word. But one of the things he said, as he prayed, John 17, 1, the hour has come. The hour has come. Now let me explain that in every one of these cases that the word hour is used, it refers to Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Primarily his death. That was the hour that it refers to. And the night of the Last Supper, as he broke the bread, passed the cup, initiated communion, remember my death until I come again, He even prayed, I know the hour has come. I know what's going to happen. A little later, interestingly, in the very same prayer, it's John 17, 4, he, that, you know, he stated his hour had come, but then he says, I glorified you on the earth having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. I glorify, he's talking to his Father God, I have glorified you on the earth because I have accomplished the work. What was his ministry? Well, it was healing, teaching. It was pointing people to God and the need of salvation. The kingdom of God is at hand. And in just three short years, Jesus did everything that was necessary to bring people to God. There was only one thing left to do. He needed to become the sacrifice for sin. The hour had come. Do you know that is why they were able to do all the horrific things that they did to Jesus from the time of his arrest to the crucifixion. 
Jesus even said, if I wanted to, I could call 12 legions of angels to rescue me. That's 12,000 angels. But he didn't. He could have eluded their grasp again. But he didn't. He didn't have to take the beatings, the mocking, and finally the cross. He could have gotten out of it at any time. And he didn't. Even when they mocked him and said, come off the cross, we'll believe you then. His hour had come. And so he did not. It was during this final accomplishment that we would hear Jesus proclaim, it is finished. I've now done everything. First, he had become the blood sacrifice for sin. We got the hint when John said, Behold, the Lamb of God. Lambs were made for sacrifice. <coughs> we know that God had said, Without the shedding of blood, there could be no forgiveness of sin. Something had to bleed. And that's why crucifixion was necessary. It is finished. I have become the sacrifice. But the other part of the it is finished is that while on the cross, Jesus also suffered the wrath of God for sin. It was the judgment that was necessary. <laughs> God had said, well, yeah, God had said it. Paul wrote it. For the wages of sin is death. That means what, what sin deserves, and we know for all of sin, is death. The death here being separated from God for eternity. To feel his wrath in the place we know as hell, later to become the lake of fire. The judgment had to be taken. And Jesus did it, being the God-man. 100% God, 100% man. He took the wrath of God. And so he could say, it is finished. Immediately after that, he does what he said he was going to do way back in the beginning of his ministry when he told his disciples, no man takes my life. I lay it down. Because the Bible says that Jesus dismissed his spirit and he died. <coughs> because death is nothing more and the separation of our spirits from our bodies. The spirit lives forever. The body stops and goes into decay. I lay it down. Jesus was only on the cross for six hours. Historians have told us that some people were on the cross for days <coughs> before they finally died. Jesus had accomplished all that needed to be done, being the blood sacrifice and receiving the wrath of God, and so he could say, it is finished, spirit, leave the body, and he died. And 
and so they put them in a tomb. They buried them. When the timing was right, the timing was right. So skip. What about like timing? Well, to fulfill Bible prophecy, Jesus had to be in the grave for three days because it was talked about. Jesus himself even said in John chapter 2, destroy this temple, meaning his body, and in three days I will raise it up again. And so, at the end of three days, on what we call Easter morning, <coughs> Jesus did exactly what he said he would do. He takes back his life, I have the authority to take it up again, and rises from the dead. He is risen. He's risen in Thank you. Yeah, Tom stole my thunder earlier. I was going to do that at the beginning, and then he did it. So I thought I'd put it in the sermon, and it caught everybody off guard, so let's try it again. He is risen. He is risen indeed. I have the authority to take it back, so he says. And he did it. And so... Jesus is alive. But that's not the end of the story. For you and me, that's the great news. But there were a group of people who were with Jesus, some who watched him die, some who were devastated. <coughs> Jesus wasn't finished. He had accomplished the work for the kingdom of God. But now he needed to spend a little time with some individuals. And so, after the resurrection, there are a number of events that take place, and I'm only going to highlight a couple. I'm going to start with Mary Magdalene at the tomb. Tomb is empty, she's upset, she doesn't know what's going on, <coughs> and Jesus appears to her. For whatever reason, Jesus did not allow her to recognize him at first. She thinks it's the gardener, so the Bible tells us, and she says, where did you take his body? I'll take it, I'll get it out of your way, <coughs> I'll bury it somewhere else. That's my paraphrase, okay? But that was her basic reaction. And then Jesus says her name, personal. He knows us by name. Mary. Her eyes are opened, her understanding is complete, and she yells out Rabboni, which is a term for my teacher. And the Bible says she clings to him. It's not just a hi, how you do an hug. She is clinging to him. Why? I believe it's because she doesn't want to lose him again. She is trying to keep him there because of her love for him, for all that he did for her. That's why Jesus has to stop her. Now his words were, I don't remember. That, those weren't his words. <laughs> See, in my notes, I put how I wanted to paraphrase it. I was going to give you his words first, but I guess I'm not. Read it. <laughs> my paraphrase is, it's not time yet for me to hang around. His words 
talked about him ascending to the Father, going back to heaven, because the relationship has now changed. Don't try to hold me here, Mary. There's things to do. And so that's the, the one thing. The other event, in a nutshell, is Jesus encourages his disciples <coughs> because in his resurrection body, the brand new body that he had after his death, <coughs> the one that could walk through walls, he couldn't do that before the crucifixion. The one who appears and disappears couldn't do that before the, re the crucifixion and resurrection. So, in his resurrection body, he does just that. He starts appearing, interacting, disappearing, appearing somewhere else, interacting, disappearing, and for the next 40 days, Jesus keeps doing this. <coughs> you know what I think? He was letting his disciples know that whether they see him or not see him, he was always going to be there with them. He even had said, I am with you always, even to the end of the earth. That was almost three years earlier. It was towards the beginning of his ministry. <coughs> Always, even to the end of the earth. And I think the appearing and disappearing was a reminder of what he had said. You may not see me, but I'm there. I'm there. And do you know... You have the very same promise. Jesus makes that promise to you who know him. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. What an encouragement to know that he's here. Always. In the Psalms, we read this. My times are in your hands. Your times are in God's hands. That's his promise. God orchestrates the events of your life to guide you to himself. Or to help you grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. What about you who are here this morning? <coughs> You're here, but you've never repented of your sins and accepted God's mercy and His gift of salvation. Your hour has not yet come. I want to tell you a quick true story. The reason I know it's true is because it was my cousin. <coughs> my cousin had aspirations to be an actress, so she moved to Los Angeles. And while there, she let her guard down and was beaten with a... Uh, one of those little tire irons, almost to the point of death. She recovered, and when she happened to visit Hawaii, I uh, took her aside and I said, you know, Joanne, <coughs> humanly speaking, you should have died. But I think God let you live so that you
you have the chance to come to him. I gave her the gospel, and she basically threw it back in my face. But her hour had not yet come, because God was giving her another chance. And you're here this morning, maybe you don't belong to Jesus Christ, as I said, never repented and accepted his gift of salvation. Your hour has not yet come. However, it will come someday. It is appointed unto man once to die, and after that comes the judgment. It is no accident that you're here this morning. Your times are in his hands. If you've never accepted Christ, don't put it off. The scripture says, today is the day of salvation. Now is the time. I want you to know I am available after the service to explain God's gift of salvation and pray with you. The choice is yours. Even though our times are in God's hands, he lets us decide what we do with the events that he orchestrates. But uh, how about you who know Jesus is your Savior? I know it's the majority of the people in here. Your hour has not yet come. God has some task for you to fulfill. Something that he wants you to accomplish. One thing, maybe several. They may be small things. Don't think you have to do some grandiose thing for God. It can be as simple as handing a sandwich to a homeless person. Or an encouraging word. Or being a prayer warrior. It doesn't have to be big. But for everyone who knows Jesus as their Savior, God has tasks. Something that he wants us to do before it's time to leave this earth and go to heaven. Um, I don't know about you, but there have been many times I have said to Jesus, Take me now! And though he's never said it out loud, the answer has been, I don't think so. I still have some stuff. He probably uses a better word than stuff, but anyhow, still have some stuff I want you to do. Your hour has not yet come. I don't know what your task is. Maybe at this point, you don't even know. It could be something God's got ready for you later on. The key is, be ready. Be ready to serve him when the opportunity comes, whatever your task may be. And just as Jesus gave encouragement to his disciples, I want to leave you with this encouragement. Jesus has made the promise through the writer of the Hebrews where he says, I will never leave you, nor forsake you. I'll never leave you, and I'll never turn my back on you. He's always there to give you the help that you need. Father God, how grateful we are for the love that you demonstrated when you made your son sin for us. Thank you that we can have this day special to remember the resurrection of Jesus Christ and that all of these things were in your timing. Father, as always, I'm grateful for those who are here this morning. I ask your blessing upon them. I ask that your spirit may continue to go with them, guiding, protecting, comforting. 
And Lord, I pray for us that you might strengthen us to do the task that you have. And Father, if there is anyone here who happens to need your son, I pray that your spirit will work in their hearts too. Be with us as we go our own way. We look forward to your working in our lives since our times are in your hands. And we will give you the glory, honor, and praise. And it's because of what Jesus did on the cross that I come. Amen.